<laughs> Hi there, you're watching the Leeds LGBT Virtual Lit Fest. I'm FR Kesby and I'm here today with Sarah Jane Slack, the Managing Director of Inspired Quill. Now, Sarah Jane is a social entrepreneur, a public speaker and apparently a stationary hoarder, to which I can relate. Um, she works as an SEO project manager by day, uh, manages the not-for-profit publishing house Inspired Quill by night and can regularly be found discussing online marketing as well as non-tokenistic diversity in publishing, which is what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, but she strives to listen and learn more than she talks. She's also scarily comfortable, apparently, talking about herself in third person, which is something that many of us writers could learn to do, uh, <laughs> and believes that to-do lists breed when you're not looking, which, uh, again, I would agree with. Is there anything else you want to add about yourself? I think that covers most of it, to be honest. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I've, I've been managing director slash volunteer of Inspired Quill for, uh, we had our ninth birthday back in April. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, yeah, love stationery. <laughs> who doesn't love stationery? Find me any writer or anybody who's interested in writing who doesn't have 600 notebooks and 800 pens yet can't find any of them. That's yeah, always the problem, isn't true. it? It's true. So tell us a little bit more about Inspired Quill then, and specifically about what we're discussing today, which is your diversity pledge, which you've got mm -hmm. a nice long diversity pledge on your website. Why mm -hmm. did you decide that Inspired Quill needed a diversity pledge? Sort of what process did you go through creating that? Is it an ongoing process or is that done now? Mm -hmm. Let's get some idea about, about that. Sure. So um, Inspired Quill actually started as a book review blog. Mm -hmm. um, back when I was a master's student uh, studying English at the uh, University of Leicester and being a book review blog obviously I was in touch with a lot of authors both self-published where you know back then it was a, a bigger thing to be self-published um, and you know indie presses and also the, the big six as they were back then before Random Penguin became a thing um, and really I just heard so many horror stories about the industry and about how the authors were treated that you know in your early 20s you get that kind of like righteous rage of you know why isn't this as good as it can be how hard is it to create win-win situations so from that I created Inspired Quill um, in the April of 2011 and really we always kind of started with this view of non-tokenistic diversity being important because one of the um one of the annoyances i had back then was listening to a lot of the other publishers say hey we've got a book with a gay protagonist where's our cookie and that just annoyed the bejeebas out of me so you know we always said non-tokenistic diversity very specifically and we didn't actually have a diversity pledge on the website until about two years ago hmm. my view of that was always well it's obvious you know obviously we need non-tokenistic diversity and of course it's important and and all of that and uh, a few years ago i was at an event um uh, a, a comic-con basically and I pitched uh, a panel about diversity and the name of the panel was is diversity in fiction important and Ooh. I so I, I pitched that as the type that was my title I pitched mm. that as the title because I want I don't take life too seriously so I went in it was the first talk of the day um, but loads of people turned up the room was packed and I was like first of all does anyone is anyone um, is everyone okay with swearing and everyone was like yeah sure and i went okay is diversity important yes no shit next question so we spent the rest of it basically understanding or digging a bit into you know the how to be non-tokenistically diverse um so to go back to your question about is this diversity pledge like a one and done thing to answer that, I updated it two weeks ago and I'm constantly learning. I, I would say certainly over the past six, six months or so, I have learned so much and quite a lot of it was uncomfortable learning mm. because it was very like, I should have known this before. I should have thought about this before. 
um, but the, the guilt is mine and this isn't about me, if that makes sense. So there's been a, an awful lot of growth just in the past six months to the extent where, you know, I'm taking a look at our back catalogue again, just to kind of see where we can improve going forward. Excellent. So it's definitely a growing process then. It's a, oh, the absolutely. That will move with sort of as the world moves and also as you learn new things. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's brilliant. And um, you talked obviously about not wanting a cookie for it, <laughs> um, yes. which is a, a phrase that we always hear like, oh, I did this, where's my cookie? Um, yeah. Which is a problem obviously with a lot of um, publishers, which kind of mm. leads on to the, what I wanted to ask about when you talk about non-tokenistic diversity. Mm. Now, obviously, I have a vague understanding of what that would mean for my own sort of sense, but I'm interested mm. in what it means to you and to Inspired Quill, and also mm. how you can ensure that you're avoiding that tokenism and therefore sure. not doing that, I want a cookie. <laughs> kind of yeah. mentality yeah. yeah definitely so a good example of this i guess would be our book sugar and snails by Anne goodwin which was shortlisted for the it was the 2016 might have been 2015 that's bad 2016 polari prize and um so we didn't actually market it as an lgbt novel mm. which maybe we should have done um or, you know, maybe we, we did the right thing. But what I didn't want to do was, was was say, like, it's an LGBT novel. LGBT people need to buy it. And that mm -hmm. just really didn't sit comfortably with me. So we marked it more as a it's a middle age. It's a midlife coming of age story um, with, you know, not a disaster of an ending, which is, again, as as um, as we all know, is, is quite um rare not not so much anymore but but certainly was a few years ago and yeah so um in terms of what non-tokenistic diversity means for me i mean you, you've got sort of the the air quote more obvious stuff like so you know um don't just have a sassy gay friend don't just have a bisexual who sleeps with everyone don't just have you know the um you know the the angry black woman trope that's just because it's in the book doesn't mean it's good representation mm. um and i think the subtleties of what is good representation is definitely something that that we've grown with as as a publishing house you know i'm not going to sit here and say we've always got everything right 100 percent of the time but you know as we are learning more we are becoming more aware of how to mindfully write so something i always say to my authors for example is okay so you you've decided that this character let's just say this character is black okay fantastic um but did you decide that this character was white in the same way that you decided that character was black or mm. did you decide that this character was straight in the same way that this character is is gay for example um, and that's something we talk a lot about, um, me, and, me and the authors, just, just to kind of, um, and you know, it, it's a process as well, like you have to kind of train yourself to think in that way when you're writing. Um, you know, it's really easy to, to very, be very specific with character hair colour, you know, and if you can do that, then you can sure as heck do everything else. Yeah, I mean, writers are obsessed with describing people's eye colour. Like, yeah. how many times have you read a book where it's been like, oh, their eyes were green with flecks of grey and blue rims, yeah. but you still have no idea what colour their skin is because you're expected yeah. to assume that they're white. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I, I really sort of understand that as a, as a writer myself. Um, I try to write diversely. I try to write about um, characters that are from different races, that are from different genders, that are from different... Um, sexualities than, than myself as well um which i suppose leads me on to a, a question about how do you distinguish between an lgbt novel as in a novel that is about mm. being lgbt mm. and a novel that just happens to have lgbt characters mm. yeah that's that's really interesting isn't it i i think it, it ha for me it has to do with what's the story so mm. It, it's almost less about the characters and more about the story in that way and I'm willing to stand on the hill of LGBT is not a genre mm. um, 
And this, this really d divides people when I say this. So for example, if you go to the Inspired Quill website, um, we have, it's, we're currently fixing it because it's broken at the moment, but we have a, a filter system and we have things like, you know, genre and the age and if it's a paperback or an ebook. And then we have themes. And one of the theme is LGBT um, because we don't have straight fiction, you know. No. So I understand the need for um, labeling LGBT fiction, because actually in, in a lot of respects, if you are growing up, um, as a person who is LGBT or even if you're already an LGBT adult, you want to kind of read that, um, that kind of love story or life story or, or whatever, um, but you've got to find it. So exactly. it's less for me about trying to be, you know, hey, we've got a gay book, give us a cookie, and more about, hey, we've got this book, are you interested as the reader and being very reader focused rather than praise focused if that makes sense yeah i think that's a brilliant way of looking at it because as a as an avid reader I, I tend to find that the only books that really explore lgbt lgbt issues are about lgbt issues mm. <laughs> it's never just yeah. a bit of the story that's like generally going on mm. um so that's really interesting sort of to get a perspective from the other side of the the publisher mm. from that mm. um can i sorry one one thing because this is something that um, I fixed last week as well mm. is in the past we have put the LGBT category on books that have a named character who is LGBT but now in terms of our the, the way that we're restructuring our filtering system that bar is going to be higher because I don't think that having a named character who's LGBT even if they you know are in a scene and they have dialogue and it's not enough like mm. I don't want people, you know, uh, readers coming in being like, you said that this book had LGBT themes and there was this one character in this one chapter. What's that? And the sad thing is at the time that was quite a, a decent bar. Mm. Um, but for us with the growth that we've had, um, certainly as I was saying over the past six months, it's just not enough anymore. Yeah. Bar, bars move and you need to move with Absolutely. the bar or suddenly find yourself under it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that you talk about in your diversity pledge is accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. Now, as somebody who is both physically disabled, mentally ill and autistic, that's not both, that's three, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, I obviously have a, a vested interest in accessibility. Um, why is it important to inspire Quill, though, to be accessible? And what kind of steps do you take to extend that accessibility, not just to the reader, but to the author as well? Mm. So I think in a cynical way, the more accessible we are, the more people who are going to buy our books. That, that's just how it is. The way um, of the world. <laughs> yeah, of course. But also, it, you know, I created Inspired Quill to connect with people effectively and, and to connect people to books, whether that book is you know, in a digital format, in paper format, in, you know, audio format, etc. That's always been really important to me. So actually, when I was setting up Inspired Quill, I was, I mentioned before, I was doing my master's in English and my dissertation, and, you know, bearing in mind, this was 10 years ago, my dissertation was on reader engagement with electronic texts. Mm. And part of that was discussing the, the different levels of accessibility of electronic texts to paper texts, for example. Um, so again, it's one of those things that it's always kind of been scratching at the back of my mind, but it was only a few weeks ago that I actually wrote it down and, and put it on the website because, you know, it's that accountability as well as the, the pledge of, well, mm -hmm. we're doing this, we're doing this, we've done this, etc. Um, this was actually really highlighted last year in August. So we went to Worldcon in Dublin okay. and there was a, um, a reader who came to the table looking for, uh, so we have like a paper catalogue, um, but he was looking for a plain text paper catalogue because he used uh, a screen reader app on his phone because he was uh, blind and we didn't have one and it was, it was horrible because you know it's kind of 
well we've got we do have a paper catalog but we don't have a plain text paper catalog so mm. we ended up um you know basically getting the individual blurbs up on the computer screen for him so he could then copy those in into a document himself so we managed to kind of um you know uh, work around that situation but it showed us that actually we needed to do more at events as well hmm. so one thing that i'm always interested in um that can be a tough question of how to how to deal with is what kind of steps have you taken or you're thinking of taking um to including that accessibility both as authors and as readers people with learning difficulties mm. that's a really interesting question and i mentioned before uh, before we started chatting that uh, this was the one that kind of made me pause for for the longest when i was reading through them um from obviously from my perspective uh you know the the audio books for example are uh, are a big thing in that regard but Honestly, that's something that I as Inspire Quill need to think more about because apart from things like audiobooks and things that are, I guess, intersectionally accessible, um, we, I've not put thought into specifics for readers or, or um, authors with uh, specific learning dif uh, difficulties. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely the, the next stage of growth for us, I think. Yes, I mean, before the interview started, we did talk a bit about it and um, how people learn difficulties are vastly underrepresented in sort of LGBTQ mm. spaces, despite the fact that you have as much chance of being LGBTQ if you've got a learning difficulty as you have if you don't have a learning difficulty. Mm. Um, so it's that kind of, but it's the difficulty, isn't it, in how do you make a novel accessible? How do you mm. make your um, website, which have descriptions of the novels, accessible mm. when it's not an industry that really is accessible at all? Mm. So it, it is a difficult one. And I really admire you admitting that you hadn't necessarily got that far in the thinking because yeah. we, we live and learn. We don't know everything. So, yeah. 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 Um, so big question. Why do you think um, that having a diverse range of both authors and readers is important both to Inspired Quill, both as a business and as sort of a not-for-profit um, sector, mm -hmm. but also to the canon of literature in the wider sense. There's a, there's a great quote by someone called, I think her name's Eleanor Arnold, and I can't say it word for word because I've forgotten it now and I don't have it written down in front of me, but it's something to do with we're very good at creating worlds that have people with, you know, six arms and green skin and all of that, but we're not very good at creating real worlds with real diversity. And maybe we should look at that. And that's a quote that really, um, really stuck with me when I first read it a few years ago. And, you know, it, it's incredibly important. And I think, my biggest struggle was realizing that not everyone thinks it's important. It's not an obvious, you know, well, obviously we don't, you know, we want non-tokenistic diversity and obviously we try not to have, you know, biases towards certain authors. Although of course there's always unconscious bias, which is mm. something that we're all also um, trying to, to reduce when our submissions open next time. Um, I'll let you know how that goes. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's incredibly important. And, you know, from even from a, a cynical business perspective, uh, cause I think that's important to talk about as well. Like I'm, I'm with Inspired Quill, you know, I've been a volunteer managing director for nine years. I've not taken a penny from, from the press for, for nine years. Hopefully one day I'll get to a stage where it can, you know, be my day job. Um, but it, it just makes business sense. If you look at a lot of the data that's come out about, you know, diversity in business itself, um, you know, diverse businesses just make business sense yeah. from, you know, fr from the other perspective, you know, it, it would have meant the world to me to grow up reading characters that I'm more thoroughly identified with. Um, 
and it has a lot to do i think with that fear of the other so even growing up as someone in in the lgbt community myself um you know not really reading that until i found fan fiction which is a whole different story and i'm sure quite a lot of uh you know millennials who are lgbt have found themselves in a in a similar um similar space um but it's not just about us it's about the the people who aren't lgbt as well using that as an example um you know they say that that books can be a window but they can also be a mirror mm. so it's it's important to remember that fear of the other can be mitigated by learning about the other even if that's in fiction and actually i would argue although i don't have any data to back this up sometimes even more so when it's in fiction because it's safe mm. yeah no i totally get that and i think it's important to note as well that despite us being part of the lgbt community and any other sort of intersectional identities you might have we are two white people sitting here talking about diversity Absolutely. which Absolutely. is something that we have to acknowledge like yeah, um definitely i didn't grow up in a racist family i'm very lucky in that way but i also don't remember ever reading books as a children where race was mentioned like mm -hmm. i read things like Enid blyton yeah. and when race was mentioned it was not done in a way that i noticed and a way that as an adult now i notice it is a good way yeah. um what, I, uh, what is it? Um, one of the characters' name, um, if you actually sort of translated it from the language it's in, literally translates as Blackie Mud Black. Because <laughs> wow. his name. And I was just like, I remember realizing this as an adult and I was going, oh no, yeah. <laughs> what was I reading? Yeah. Um, but that shows growth as well. You know, we, we do have to acknowledge that there is a certain amount of, of growth and, you know, especially with what's been happening recently we need to expedite that and we need to do the work mm. um my my reading list for example you know i've always obviously tried to have a, a very diverse uh reading list when i'm not reading inspired quill stuff mm. um but you know just being i think it, it comes down to mindfulness as well definitely definitely yeah um yeah i went through uh not this year but last year i set myself a target of reading more books by people who weren't white the people who mm. were white and more mm. books by people who weren't men the people who were men which mm. when i went through despite the fact that i am somebody who believes in diversity and believes in supporting these authors when i went through my bookcases i was disappointed in myself yeah. <laughs> because one of the things that i love is crime fiction mm. and crime fiction predominantly is written by white people and predominantly mm. by white men Mm. Um, which is starting to change. There's great sort of female um, crime fiction authors like that, Sophie Hannah. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's that diversity, it's just not there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's really interesting. So moving on to um, a question for the sake of authors as opposed to readers, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to authors who have written stories with these non-tokenistic diverse characters in there or stories that are specific about an experience like a, a mm -hmm. book that you would put into the lgbt category or the black stories mm -hmm. category mm -hmm. what advice would you give those people who are approaching publishers other than go to inspired quill obviously <laughs> what other <laughs> advice would you give them on how to pitch those stories what the best way to get those stories heard would be mm. That's a really great, great question. And obviously one that I, I get quite a lot. And obviously I can only caveat this by saying that Inspire Quill is a tiny micro press and mileage may vary. Um, but I, I would definitely say whoever you're submitting your book to, make sure that they're going to be a good fit for you. So for example, if, you know, someone submitted a book to Inspired Quill and, you know, they ended up being a, a, a turf, for example, we wouldn't, we couldn't work together. We just couldn't. Um, mm. Regardless of their other, you know, how progressive they might be on, on other sides of things. So just make sure that the, um, the, the place you're submitting to carries your values as well. Um, and if you don't know if they carry your values, because as I mentioned, we didn't have a diversity pledge until a couple of years ago, mm. um, send them an email, ask them, you know, we're, 
we're real people sat behind a screen and if they don't get back to you maybe they're not the publishing house for you because if they can't answer a simple question um, the other thing I would say from a more slightly pragmatic point of view I guess is make sure you read the submission guidelines <laughs> um, I get so like we're a tiny micro press but I get so many submissions that it's the book that's sent to me in like a PDF format and I specifically ask for a Word document, not because I hate PDFs, but because I like giving feedback where, you know, where I have time and I can't do that on a PDF. Um, so I, you know, I used to send out emails saying, Hey, you attached a PDF. We need a Word document. Sorry. Um, now I just delete them. And that's really, really harsh, but again, not following the, the guidelines. And, you know, some places do make you go through, a lot of hoops like it needs to be 1.21 centimeters from the edge of a word document and 1.3 line space and all that mm -hmm. um again do you want to work with people like that um good but yeah so <laughs> the, the two things are make sure that you're a, a good fit and um follow the follow the submission guidelines so that brings me nicely on to the final question and one that i'm sure every writer watching this wants to know the answer to by by now um, how do we submit our work to Inspired Quill? If we've got a book that we're going after, this sounds like the press for me. What kind mm -hmm. of books do you take? How do we do that? Do you have submission windows? That kind mm -hmm. of information, because there will be people by this point who are already looking up on your website, I promise you. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, well, uh, the, the bad news is we're not open for submissions at the moment. The good news is that um, there may be a time in September where we are open for unsolicited submissions. Um, that's to be confirmed, but we have a submission page on the website mm -hmm. and it uh, goes through clearly sort of uh, what we're looking for. Um, it has a whether we're closed or open, so you can see really, really quickly. Um, so in terms of genres, we're accepting fantasy, science fiction, steampunk, dystopian, literary fiction and crime, which I know is a bit of a strange mix. Um, age ranges, YA and adult. And in terms of themes, um, LGBT, feminist and um, own voices in any of those genres. So quite a wide, um, quite a wide variation i guess um there's also a, a pdf download which on, on that page which outlines the steps so you know if you submit an, uh, a book um it will take this long this is what you'll get if it's yes this is the process if no this this is the process so we generally for a first um first round submission we ask for two chapters so the first two chapters and a, uh, a cover letter and a synopsis, which all of the authors listening to this have gone, ah, oh, cover letters. Um, and, and synopsis, I hate writing a synopsis. How are you supposed to jam an entire novel into like 500 words? It doesn't you, work. You do it as long as you need. So <laughs> this is quick tip for all the writers out there. Write a synopsis as long as you need to write it. So if that's 10 pages, write a synopsis that's 10 pages and then half it. So you pick out the 50% that's the most important and then you half it again and again and again until it's the right length, because then you kind of prioritize the important sections and how you're writing about them. That's a great tip. Thank you. <laughs> um, excellent. So basically keep an eye on the website, see mm -hmm. when you're opening, um, yep. have a look at the submission guidelines we've yeah. been told <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. and keep an eye out for what Inspired Quill are doing next because you've got some great looking titles on there um, hopefully you'll yeah. have some great titles coming up as well um, mm -hmm. is there anything else that you want to add about Inspired Quill or about your diversity pledge um, just that we're, we're on Facebook and Twitter as well and if anyone's got any questions they can get in touch with me directly so the contact form on the website actually works it's a real contact form it comes through to us um, or you can get in touch via my email, which is sjslack at uh, inspired-quill.com. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions about, you know, our diversity pledge or, um, you know, getting into the industry and anything like that. I'm always happy to kind of sit down with people and uh, 
try and pull back the curtain slightly because as we all know this is not an industry that's known for its transparency but uh, trying to change that. <laughs> Excellent well it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you so thank you so much for doing this interview. Absolutely um, thank you. I hope you and everybody else gets a chance to check out some of the other great LGBT uh, Blitfest virtual events there's lots of cool stuff being organized uh, so thank you very much for coming to talk to me thank you very much for watching and thank you to uh, Leeds LGBT Lit Fest for having us. <laughs>